stand. Just that microphone. John Marvin Murdoch, M U R D A U G H. Mr. Murdoch, will you tell the jury just briefly um, some background information? Where are you from? Uh, what do you do? Yes, sir. So, um, so I was born in Columbia, um, grew up in Hampton, attended public schools from first grade through high school, graduated Wade Hampton, um, went to the University of South Carolina, got a degree in criminal justice, and, uh, and I'm now self-employed. I've, I've opened some companies in the heavy equipment business. What's the name? What's the name of your company? Well, the, the main company is Murdoch Rental Center, but I've got Murdoch Kubota, uh, Murdoch Equipment LLC. So, generally speaking, I'm in the construction equipment, agricultural tractors and implements. Um, I'm in the equipment business. And, and do you have um, offices? Uh, I mean, locations, uh, multiple locations. Uh, I have two: one in Hampton and one in Okatee, Bluffton area. Are you related to the defendant, uh, Richard Alexander Murdoch? I am. I'm his brother. Uh, do you have any other brothers? I do. Um, Randy Murdoch is my brother. And do you have a sister? I do. Lynn. All right. Both are here. And, and, and your parents are whom? Uh, Randolph and Libby Murdoch. Okay. Are you the only um, son of the three that didn't go to law school? I am, and I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> tell, tell the jury generally about, about the Murdoch family, your family in, in this area. Well, I mean, obviously, we're probably like most families, or a lot of families, we're very close. I mean, the siblings, we, we stay in touch. We do holidays together. We, you know, you try to interact and, and keep your family core together. I mean, we're just... You know, a normal family doing, doing normal family things. Right. Um, do um, your parents, and we, we've heard about your father, Randolph Murdoch, who died on, on June the 10th, is that correct? That's correct. And then your mother's Miss Libby? She is. And, and she's still alive, correct? She is. In fact, yesterday was her birthday. And you went by to see her, I understand. I did. Um, with my kids. The, um, in, the, in the spring of 2021, uh, were they both alive? Um, was your dad alive? Uh, yes. yes, sir. And, and what was his health in the spring of 2021? Well, for, for some, he had been battling cancer, uh, and not just cancer. I'll use that term loosely. He had multiple forms of cancer. Um, but he had been battling cancer, had health issues. He had been through heart surgeries. Just overall, his health was not good. Um, you know, just in and out of hospitals, just, just right. age and, and the diseases were, were catching up to him. And, um, and would, would you check in on your mom and dad any chance you got? I, I would, I would. So... I didn't tell you all this, but so I don't live in Hampton. I live, my wife and family and I, we live down in Beaufort or just outside of Beaufort. And so my drive is about an hour's drive to, to do it. So I didn't visit as often as Randy and, and, and Alec because they were in Hampton. But absolutely, um, anytime I, I had the opportunity to work in Hampton at my office, I would always take time to stop by. Um, and then sometimes I would just, you know, just wanted to go see my mom. The um, and was it was it routine for one, so your, either your brothers who lived in Hampton um, to stop by and check on them routinely? Oh, absolutely. I, I in fact I, I, you know, I don't know every time they went because I wasn't there, but but I feel confident that they visited more just because of the proximity. It's just an easier it's just an easier visit. So well, let's let's talk about proximity. Um, your brother Randy, where does he live? He lives in Hampton, in town. And then your sister, Lynn, where does she live? She lives in Somerville. Okay. And then Alec, where, where did he live in the um, spring of 2021? Well, I think in the spring of 21, he was living in Moselle. I think all of them were. Okay. 
and Ms. Moselle close to Almeda? Where, well, it's further than Randy's house, but much closer than mine. Right. And, and is that in your mother's house? I'm saying Almeda, but is Almeda a town? Or what no, no, Almeda? Almeda's correct. That's the that's the the location. That's the property name, if you will, the intersection name. I think that's a general. And just tell the jury where the, where that's located. Uh, it would be um, just uh, east of Varnville, maybe two or three miles outside of the town limits. Is it is it basically at the intersection of? I don't know what what's that mean. Intersection of 278 and Highway 68 that would go to one goes to Ridgeland, one goes to Yemas. Okay. And um, and would Alec visit your mom and dad frequently in the spring of 2021? Your knowledge? Oh, absolutely. And we'll get to more of that. Um, how well? I want to talk about Paul. How well did you know Paul? I knew Paul very well. Um, Excuse me, I'm going to have a hard time talking about Paul because we had a very special relationship. But I knew him very well. And I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer any questions about him. Well, did he have a nickname? Um, <laughs> he did. They, they called him Little Rooster. And um, did they call him anything else? Well, I mean, he'd been called Little Rooster. He'd been called, as you heard, Paul Paul. I mean, that's what my family, my kids called him. What, what did you call him? Well, it depends on where we were and, and what we were doing. When, um, when we were, excuse me, when we were doing something fun and a, a social event, I would refer to him as Paul Paul. Now, y'all haven't heard this yet, but he worked for me. So when he worked for me, it was Paul or it was Paul Terry because I was trying to be, you know, a little more authoritative. Right. Who, who else called him Paul Paul? Uh, most of all the family, um, and, and that's not you know that's not a name that was said at all times. But but when we're having fun, kids would say it, my wife would say it. Um, it, it. It was just a it was just a a name that was used in fun times and and in in normal times. And and you mentioned Paul worked for you. When when did he work for you? You know that's. Um, I thought you were asked that, and unfortunately I don't know. He's worked for me maybe. Prior to, to June of 21, he was working, or he was working then. I think he worked the two summers prior to that. And, and it was just summer work. I mean, it, it, you know, it would only last a month or so, a month and a half. And was he working for you in June of 2021? He was. And what was he doing for you? Anything I asked him to do. And where was it, he working? He was working at my Bluffton Okatee store. He would do anything from power wash equipment or or deliver new tractors that were being sold um, talk to customers help customers load and unload um, rental equipment um, it, he did it, as you heard someone testify that boy would work and so whatever was asked of him he would do was he on the phone the whole time or did he actually work not at work he was not well not while I was there was he a good worker? He was an excellent worker. The um, did did um, you spend time with with Paul? Uh, well, you let me back up. Do, do you have a place where you hunt? You have a property. I do. Do you have a name for that property? We call it Greenfield. <clears throat> and um, and would Paul and Buster come out to Greenfield to hunt? Uh, they would, um, would absolutely. Um, let, let me just back up. With can, what was the relationship between Alec, Paul, and Buster? Oh, it was a great relationship. Um, you know, anything that that the boys were doing, Alec wanted to do, and 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 the boys always came first to him. Um, I, and some of y'all may have, have been on dove hunts before, but we would have very, I have a very small field, and you know I've got ten stands in the field, and I have before the hunt I have it organized where I know who's sitting where. Well, I have Ella. Like he says, "Well, can the boys come?" Well, of course they can come. So now I've got to rearrange for that. Or if it, they said they were coming and the boys backed out, Ella always backed out. I, 
I was thinking about this. To this day, I don't believe he has ever come hunting with me since his boys have been old enough to hunt without his boys. It's always with the boys. <clears throat> did he do other things with with them? Yeah, did, did sporting events, um, you know, football games, baseball games. Was he close with his sons? Very close. Right. And how about Maggie? What do you... What did you observe of his relationship with Maggie? Um, it was a, you know, it was a great relationship. I mean, I, all marriages, I'm sure, have have hiccups here and there. But I'm telling you, it was a good marriage. Um, I, in in coming here, I, I was trying to think of ways that to describe it. I, my wife and I and Ellick and Maggie, we went to a concert together. It was the Darius Rucker concert. Um, and, of course, we're sitting in there. Ellick and Maggie are sitting just below us. And I had just gone and I, I, I hope I can say this in court. I had just gone and bought one of those $15 beers. And I was back in my seat and songs playing. And my wife taps me. And Ellick and Maggie are holding hands and swaying together. And she was like, why aren't you holding my hand? And so my $15 beer got put down. The... Um they, they had a great relationship. I mean, that's just, that's just one of many football games. They would put out a tailgate spread. They would welcome the kids, family, friends. It, it was just a wonderful. And, and did they do a lot of family things together with Paul and Buster and Paul and Buster's friends? Uh, yes, they did. Um, you know, I, I knew of or knew of trips that they would take, uh, family trips, um, you know, vacations. Um, they had a house at Edisto that y'all have heard about, and they would have, um, you know, they would always have friends come over, particularly the boys' uh, friends. There, there's, there's been some discussion during this case about, during this trial, about Paul leaving guns and stuff around. Did you ever experience that? I did. And tell the jury a little bit about your experience. Oh, well, you know, I've heard the testimony about it, and, and it's accurate. I mean, I could I could tell you all a hundred stories of him leaving things, but but he was notorious. He would come stay with us at our house. He would leave. Liz would have all of his clothes washed, and you know, he just like he just left and didn't care about where his clothes were. Um, in fact, Paul came duck hunting with me one time, and um, at Greenfield. And, and I smile fondly on this when I, you know, think back on all this. Um, so we had a great duck hunt. Um, there, I think there were three of us in the blind. Great duck hunt. We picked up, picked up all the birds, decoys, and we left. And we go back up and have a nice breakfast. You know, doing all the post hunt, all the fun things that you do. Well, I went back hunting. Um, I don't know. It was probably a week and a half, maybe two weeks later, and his hunting gear is still in the blind. I mean. It, I, I just I, I had to smile when I saw it. I was like, "That's Paul." Right. Did um, I want to ask you a little bit about riding property? I mean, you ride prop your property down at Greenfield. I do. And um, and if you but ridden, ri riding in what, what what like checking on the property? You, do you? Oh, you mean like just riding around, joy riding, or checking feeders, or right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and. And do you, do you always carry a gun when you're doing that? Uh, I don't. And have you ridden property like at your dad's place with your dad and, and maybe Alec or others? I mean, is that right. a well, frequent occurrence? I would say almost never when I rode the property with my dad. Um, it, um, almost never carry a gun? Ne almost never would we carry a gun. We would just enjoy right now. If, you know, if it were late in the afternoon and we were considering maybe getting in a deer stand, you know, at the last minute, Possibly, but typically with my dad and us, we didn't carry a gun then. Right. Speaking of your dad, what was, um, you recall what was going on with his health the, the weekend, um, uh, the Saturday, Sunday, uh, before June the 7th, so I guess would start Friday would be the 4th, Saturday would be the 5th, Sunday would be the 6th. Right. Um, so he, he was actually in the hospital, I believe, in Columbia that weekend. Um, and I think he got out of the hospital on, on Sunday. Okay. And, and 
Did you pick him up? Your brother picked him up? You know who picked I him up? I did not. I did not. I didn't. It, on, I may have been out of town. I, I can't recall. I've you know heard the, the testimony about it. I, I did not pick him up. Did uh, did you end up taking your father to the doctor on that Monday, June the seventh? I did. And where did you take him? I took him to Savannah. And um, to his what I would call his his normal doctor. Okay. I think Columbia was um, was maybe he had to go up there for some different things or another, I'm not sure. And and was he having some breathing issues on, on He was having Monday? major breathing issues. And and when you went to the doctor on Monday, June the seventh, um, was there a decision made to admit him to the hospital? It was. So when I took him, it was we were only going to a doctor's appointment. We were he, we were not going to the hospital. We it was it was just me taking him to a, a doctor's appointment to try to find out what the breathing issues were, maybe you know some type of a treatment or, 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 or medication or something to help him. Um, while we were there, while, you know, as soon as the, not as soon as the doctor saw him, but when the doctor saw him and, and went through some things, he immediately told both of us that he had to be in the hospital, that he was not getting the oxygen that he, that he needed. And, and what, when, was he admitted on that Monday? He was. And what was, as you understood, the prognosis uh, when he was put back in the hospital on Monday the 8th, I mean the 7th? Oh, Monday the 7th, yes. Yeah, so, so my understanding was the doctor that, that we were seeing or that he was seeing um, had some really strong beliefs that, that, the, that the cancer that he had was not causing the, the breathing obstructions, that it very likely could be pneumonia. And, and he told us, he said, if it's the cancer, um, that's the worst. But if it's pneumonia like I think it is, I think we, we've got some treatment options. So what, what was, was there hope on oh, June the 7th? Absolutely. When he told me that, I mean, it, well, first of all, when he said he had to go into the hospital, it scared me. You know, obviously it scares you when a doctor tells you you immediately have to check in. Um, but, yes, him explaining that, that he was optimistic that it was going to be pneumonia and that there would be a breathing treatment to help it. Um, I felt, I felt pretty good. Now, in evidence, and I'm not going to read it again, but did did you and your brother um, send out emails? I mean, excuse me, text messages to family members, giving them an update. On, we did, and that was on the seventh. That was on the seventh. And, and in the update, did you explain the doctor believed it was pneumonia? Yes, I, I gave a a, a basic. Um, summary of what I was told by the doctor, what, what I believed it to be. I, I think Randy and I had a few minutes to talk, and he typed up a, another email just to make sure that everybody was in the loop. Okay. And oh, I'm sorry, not an email, a text message. Text message. I'm sorry. Okay. And, and did the diagnosis and the prognosis subsequently change on well, your death? It did. Now, it did. When, when was that? Well... So on Tuesday afternoon, um, we're back out at Alameda. I mean, I'm sorry, we're back at Moselle. And, you know, we still hadn't heard much. I mean, all this other stuff going on, it just, as you can imagine, it's just, it's just it's so much going on. Um, Randy, Randy called me and told me they had done everything that they could do and that he would be coming home in an ambulance. Under hospice care. Okay. And did he die on June the 10th? He died, I think, two days later. There's... Take your time. That's all right. That's all right. Going back to taking your dad to the uh, doctor and then checking in the hospital, there's there's some vehicles <clears throat> being switched around a little bit, and and it and and we we'll get to you know the, that. But can, can you explain to the jury how all that transportation went to get to your dad? to the hospital, well, doctor. You're talking about on that Monday for me yeah, to yes. get him? On, yeah. yeah, on June, yeah, so the, it, June the 7th. 
it's a, it's a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll do my best to explain it. So Randy, on Monday morning, Dad had been in the hospital Sunday, got out Sunday, knew that he needed to be seen by his regular doctor, but, but did not have an appointment. And so Randy was doing everything he could to get him in as early as he could on that Monday and, uh, and just asked me, he says, if I get the appointment, can you take him? And I said, absolutely, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Um, a little while later, an hour or two, I, I don't know, it was still that morning, Randy calls me and says, okay, they have an opening for him, but he has to get there right away. So Hampton is, what, an hour and a half from Savannah, hour and I don't know, an hour and a half. He said, um, you don't have time to drive to Hampton to get him. I will meet you in Ridgeland about halfway, which is not far from my house. Uh, and then you just take him, and I'll, I'll go back. He had some time-sensitive uh, things to, to work on. So we met at Palmetto Co-op in Ridgeland. Um, I got in my mom's car with my dad. Randy got in my truck and drove it back to Almeda, where Randy had had come to pick up my dad. So Randy trucks back at mom and dad's house. So I drive dad to Savannah in my mom's car, go through what we just talked about, the doctor's appointment, getting checked in. Um, and back then there was, COVID was still going on and there, there were several restrictions. They wouldn't let me go back with my dad at that time. Um, so I was going to be driving home and now I'm stuck in my mom's car. So I knew Paul was working, and it was, I guess it was around 5 or so, and, and that's when we closed. Um, I called Paul and said, Paul, listen, um, I need you to, if you would, drive my mom's car back to Almeda, um, pick up my truck, and bring it to work the next morning. And then just leave your, he was driving a, 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 like a farm truck that day. I said, leave it, and I'll drive it, and we'll just swap back the next morning. And so that's, that's how our cars got swapped. All right, so... <clears throat> When you got back on the evening of the 7th, did you see Paul? Uh, I did. And where did you see him? At my house. And and he he got into your mom's Got sedan, into my mom's car. And drove, right. to Al- and drove it to Almeda and then got in my truck and drove it to Moselle. Okay. <clears throat> and you said the farm truck was at your house. Do you, do you remember where Paul's truck was? Uh Paul's normal truck was in the shop being uh, worked on. Was that Jimmy Butler's? It was a shop in Varnville, Jimmy Butler's, yes, okay. sir. Now, when you last saw Paul, was was he just as normal as you see him every day? Or was... Oh, absolutely. Um, he was playing with my kids in the yard, waiting on me to get there. In fact, that particular day, he was, he was pretty dirty. So whatever he had been doing back at work... Um, had him pretty dirty, but it, he was playing with the kids in the yard, being Paul. Is that the last time you saw him? That is the last time I saw him. When, when did you um, learn that, and how did you learn that Maggie and Paul were murdered on the 9th of June the 7th? Well, I, 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 Alec called me, and Liz and I, we don't. We have three young kids, younger kids. I mean, our youngest is eight now, so it would have been six at the time. And so, we don't have a lot of free time to ourselves. But that night, we were we were watching television, um, and. Um, well, let, let let me but, back up. Had, had Alec called you earlier in the night when he was on his way to? Oh yes, sir. His mom. Yes, sir. And and we got phone records of that. What, what do you recall of that conversation? He called, um, you know, just. Checking on me, just said, you know, I saw the news about Dad. Um, things look good, you know. It was a brief conversation, and and I, I hate to say it, but I, I kind of said, listen, man, listen, I finally have a few minutes. Um, can can we talk tomorrow? You know, we're watching a movie. And what was his demeanor when you spoke with him on the evening of the 7th? Same as always, just okay. normal. And then later on that night, you, you got... Another phone call from him? And I got the, that, when you asked the question, how did I learn, that's, yeah. yes, Ellick called me and, and just absolutely hysterical. Um, as soon as I heard his voice, I knew something bad was going on, didn't know what. Um, and, you know, and I, and I'm in my pajamas. Um, he said, you know, something, something bad is really happening. And I don't know how with his exact words, but um, I think he said uh, Maggie and Paul have been hurt really badly. Please get here as fast as you can. 
and you know I drop what I'm doing and I, I go get dressed and I'm I'm hurrying I'm you know just just so many things are going through your mind you don't know what to do so I, I get dressed and I run outside and realize I don't have a car I've Paul's cars out there and, and it is a hunk of junk and I mean you know and this was the farm truck this was the farm truck and so I knew I couldn't take my wife's car because she was taking the kids to school and I at this point I you know I, I knew something bad I just didn't know how bad it was and so did you then get in the farm truck and head to Moselle I did I did and, and what happened along the way well so along the way I'd spoken to Randy um, he asked me to try to get in touch with um, a, a close family friend and one of their law partners, Danny Henderson. Uh, I was just constantly trying to call him. I'm driving. I'm driving fast. I'm just I'm trying to get to Moselle. And, uh, you know, it, once I got Danny and, and told him that, that he needed to get up there, um, you know, I had a, a, just a, a few minutes to myself, and I just it, it, I was crying. And somebody called me shortly after that. I, I, I don't know whether I don't know who it was. I can't remember, but I remember it was either Ella or Randy, I, I believe. And, and they said they were the sheets were being pulled over. Did did the farm truck break down? It did. How'd you end up getting to Moselle? Well, so let me back up and, and tell you. So, so the route that. From my house down in, in Oka de Beaufort, takes me to Coosahatchee, and I get on 95 to go to Yemassee and getting off and coming up that way. Well, another close family friend, his name is Greg Alexander. He is the um, chief of police in Yemassee. Um, I reach out to him, and, and I just say, Greg, I, you know, I gave him a, a said, you know, said something bad had happened. Or, or Again, I don't know when I was told about the sheets, but... But I told him, I said, listen, something bad's happened. we got to get up there. When I get to Yemassee, can you please help make sure I get to Moselle? Because this truck's sputtering, and I knew it wasn't good. And, and he met me at Yemassee, and he, you know, he fell in behind me, and we started driving um, until he finally passed me in Varnville. And, and well, go ahead. And, and did he end up driving you the rest of the way? Well, he did. So, so he passed me shortly before Varnville. He took a ride on 63, and he was a little ways ahead of me um, when, the, when the truck quit on me. Um, I called him and, and said, Greg, I said, you know, come back and get me. The truck has, has broken down. And, of course, he picked me up and took me straight on the Moselle. Did, um, were there any guns in the, in the farm truck? That Paul had left when, when you got in it? I have no idea. It was dark when I got in it. I, I, as y'all can imagine, I was frantic. Um, I jumped in it, and I took off. Did you ever see any guns in, in it? In any? That, that night, never. I mean, I, I didn't look. I mean, it just right. it, I wasn't looking in the back seat. I wasn't worried about anything except getting to Moselle. Okay. Do you remember uh, about the time you... You got to Moselle. <clears throat> what what time was it, roughly? Or better yet, who was there when you got there? Oh, well, there were there were. Uh, I mean, well before I got to Moselle, or we got to Moselle, you could see the lights flashing. It was just it, there, there were tons of people. It, mostly, what I would describe as is first responders of some sort. And, and when you pulled up, where did you go? Um, so we came in the main gate and came around and um, and they had created a I guess a, a small crime scene and when we pulled up I, I saw Ellick and I, I think before Greg even stopped the car I jumped out and ran to him and what was his condition Alex oh he was, he was just broken I mean distraught I mean everybody was there were a few other people there but but he just all we did is hugged and cried I mean we didn't I don't even know that we talked how long, um, how long did you stay down adjacent to the crime scene, do you recall? Quite some time. Um, I, you know, I have to assume that I probably was there at the 11 o'clock-ish. I, I, I don't know what time I got there. But I don't think we went back up to the house, um, you know, until well, well after midnight, maybe 2, 3. And, and when you went to the house... Um, 
you recall if any sled agents came up there? Well, I did not see any. Um, I heard some testimony of some game and got some clothes, but I did not see any sled agents at the house. The last, the last officer that I remember seeing that night um, or officers were the ones that told us that we needed to leave that area, that they were going to be doing stuff with the bodies, and that we needed to go to the house. Um, when you went into the house, uh, were there other people in there when, when you got in? There were. You know, m most people that I knew, you, some of Alex's partners, Randy's partners, um, family members, Lynn. Um, was there food out or, or had food? What, what was it? Had anything? Well, didn't well I, I didn't see any food, but I saw pots and pans, and, uh, and I saw folks that were, that were cleaning up. They were removing pots and pans, but, you know, I never opened it and looked in it, so I presumed that it was food. Um, they cleaned dishes. They put sure. the pots and pans away or in the refrigerator. Was was a TV on in the house? Do you, do you remember? Uh, you know, I, based on what I know, I would say it is, but I can't, uh, I can't tell you 100% that it was on, but I would, I'd be willing to bet it was. What do you mean? When you say based on what you know, well, it, I've never—I don't think I'd ever been in that house without the TV being on if Alec and Maggie were there. After, um, well, did you ultimately go to Almeida that evening with Alec, Buster, and his girlfriend Brooklyn? Um, we did. Do you remember what Alec was wearing when uh, he went to Almeida? Uh, not precise. I mean, I, I can't, he was wearing shorts and a T-shirt. I can't tell you details, but it was shorts and a T-shirt, you know, like relaxed shorts. Do you know whether he had had a shower or not? Uh, it appeared he had. Okay. I mean, his, his hair was not. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I didn't see him in the shower, but I can tell you I think he had a shower. I understand. So then let's move forward to the morning of the June 8th. I, I guess, did you get any sleep the night of June the 7th? Very little. Um, I, I don't know that I fell asleep. I, I've certainly laid in the bed. Um, it just, as you can imagine, just the thoughts and things. It, I don't know if I slept. I, when, I, when, when I got up and started moving the next day, I certainly didn't feel, feel like I'd slept. What did you do the next day when you got up? Um, you, you talking about precisely or generally? Just generally. Um, I got up and um, Alec was up. I don't think Buster and Buckman were. I told Alec that I was going over to Greenfield, my farm that I told you all about, is two or three miles away, so it's very close. And I, I have all you know, clo I have plenty of clothes over there. So I told him I was going over there to shower and put on fresh clothes, and that I would meet him at Moselle. And did you go to Moselle? I did, after I left Greenfield, yes, sir. And do you remember who was there when you got to Moselle? I was the first one there. And what did you do? I just went to stay there until I knew Buster, Brooklyn, and Ellick were coming. Um, I suspected that other family members and partners, I, I knew others were coming, so I just kind of sat there just, you know, in, just in disbelief still. It's just, you know, moments of, of just... Was, was the door to the house unlocked? Do you remember? You know, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I thought about it. I don't remember. Right. Um, it, it either was unlocked or, or I had the code because there's a keypad on a, on a side door. But I can't tell you which door I went in. I, I, I don't know. The, uh, did you eventually go down to the kennels? Um, I did. I did. Um, you know, once everyone got there, there was just there was you know a fair amount of activity in the house with family and, and law partners, um, Alex's law partners, Randy's law partners. Um, you know, I I just felt like I needed to go down. I needed to see for myself what what had gone on and just you know just kind of take it in. I mean, just maybe for some type of understanding. How long did you stay down, down there at the kennels? Well, I, I can't. I, I don't know. Um, but I will say this: before I went, 
I was I was unsure whether I was allowed to go because I, I knew it was a crime scene, and so I reached out to a um, a friend of mine in law enforcement, and uh, and said, "Listen, I don't I don't know who's handling the crime scene. I don't know whatever." He said, "Well, I'll find out, and and make sure that it's clear for you to go." And he said, and "He said don't go until you know until I tell you." And he called me back a, you know, a few minutes later and said he had spoken to. Um, uh, I believe it was uh, Captain Ryan Neal, and had given the the okay that everything was released and it was okay to to go there. And and was it cleaned up? Um, no, Jim, it was not cleaned up. Okay. Were there skull fragments? Yeah. So you know, so so. Excuse me. Oh, this could be really difficult. So I, I could easily see where Maggie had been. You know, I saw the night before where the sheets were, but and somebody had told me that who was who, and so I could see where Maggie had been, and it was grass, and you know, they had covered it up with dirt, so there really was nothing to see where Maggie was. Um, I walked over to the feed room, and y'all have heard the descriptions. Y'all saw it. I've never seen pictures, and I've told them before coming to this court that I was not going to see pictures. But y'all can imagine what I experienced. It had not been cleaned up. I saw blood. I saw brains. I saw pieces of skull. Or, and when I say brains, it, it could just be tissue. I, I don't know what I was seeing. It was just it was terrible. Um, and for some reason, I thought it was my something that, that I needed to do for Paul. To clean it up. I felt like it was the right thing to do. I felt like I owed him. And I started cleaning. And I can promise you, no mother or father or aunt or uncle should ever have to see and do what I did that day. I don't know. I, I, I'm not blaming anybody, but it's just... It, I was just overwhelmed. I, I did everything I could, and I, I would have moments where I would, I would, I would stop crying for a moment, um, and just, just you know, just in disbelief. Um, at one point, I called my brother Randy, and, and, and told him what I was doing, trying to describe what I was doing, and he immediately told me to stop doing it. It, it, it was not good for me. It was not healthy for me to be there, and. I couldn't stop. I just, I had to do it for Paul. That's just what I had to do. Um, and I don't know, it's probably 15, 20 minutes later, Mark Paul shows up. Y'all heard Mark Paul testify. And he came and hugged me and told me it was okay to leave. Okay to leave what was left of Paul. That they would clean it up. the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. Yes, sir. What did you do next? Um, you know, Mark um, basically got me, you know, I'm, I'm, sure I'm, uh, I'm sure I was just a basket case, but he got me back to the house and, you know, got me back around family and, you know, just got back to, you know, the support of others that were there. And, and, you know, there were a lot of people at the house at that point. Do you remember um, when you got back to the house, at some point in time, people uh, raising questions or bringing up the fact that Maggie's phone had not been located? Um, yeah, so that was, you know, particular the the lawyers they were all you know being lawyers they were you know questioning things amongst themselves and you know how could this happen trying to figure things out but but it was brought to my attention that Maggie's phone was not there and that law enforcement had not found it and and I, I can't say that in fact it's, I can probably say that I didn't think of it because I'm not a phone, big phone user or big app user or what not, but somebody brought to my attention and says, listen, if Buster or Alec, if they have an app on their phone, like find my, find my phone or find my friends or 
an app like that, they said you very likely can find out where the phone is if the battery's not dead. And so I, I went to Buster, and um, sure enough, he, I said, Buster, do you have this one of these apps like they're talking about? And he said, yeah, sure I do. I said, well, open it up. He opened it up, and he handed me the phone, and I see Maggie's name, and I press it where, you know, to activate it, and it pings Maggie's phone just out front of the property. And I was like, I, I, I hate to say it, but I said, holy shit, there it is. And I said, Buster, I'm taking your phone. I'm going to go back down to the, to the shed and show it to law enforcement. And, and did you, who did you approach first about about the phone? Well, I don't know who it was. Uh, presumably it was sled agents because keep in mind, I, I didn't know any of these guys with sled. I mean, I, I, there were a couple of faces that I'd seen before, but I, I don't know these guys. Um, I've come to know them, but I don't know them or didn't know them then. So I went up to, the, to a sled agent and, or two sled agents and said, presumably sled agents, and said, hey, I've got Buster's phone here. And it, it's got an app on it that can find the phone, and it's showing Maggie's phone's right out here. Let's, um, y'all want to let's go get it. And he said, no need. We have technology coming later today that we should be able to find it. And it just it blew me away that I'm sitting here showing them where Maggie's phone is, but they won't take the time to walk with me or take this phone itself. I mean, I'd give them the phone to go find it. So I walk over. I knew Duffy Stone. He was the solicitor. I knew uh, one of his investigators. I walked over to them, said the exact same thing, and they immediately said, absolutely, let's, let's go find this thing before the battery goes dead. And, and what happened? That we did that. Um, and well, we started, actually, we started walking down the, the, the back entrance or the kennel entrance, if you will, and as we were, and at that time, the, the agent was holding the phone. You know, I'm looking at it with him. And the, when it pings, it creates a dot or, or, a, or a location. And that dot jumped from right at the end of that road down the road, I don't know, maybe a half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Um, and so we walked back, got into a car, and drove down to where it was, it was showing the phone. And was the phone? And I rode, I rode with those agents, the, the solicitor's office agents. Was the phone ultimately located? On the side of the oh, road? Absolutely. We found it in a matter of minutes. Okay. Do you, do you remember how it was collected? I mean, were you present when it was collected? I was. Um, so I was on, the, there was a cow pasture on one side and it's wooded on the other side. And I was on the side that, that the cow pasture is on, if you will. And I heard him say, I got it. And so, you know, of course, I walked back beside his car and, I, you know, I'm, good ways from it, but I see him over there. And I think he, he took either some ribbon or some, some flagging or flagging tape and, and marked the phone. And I don't think he touched it. I think he, he left it right where it was, called SLED. And maybe at that time, maybe they, they had been communicating, but SLED had, had blocked off the road at this point, and one of the agents came up and picked the phone up. Okay. And, I, and I don't know which agent. Again, I didn't know him. Did did any law enforcement officer ask you if you knew the password? Yes. Yeah, so, so once they uh, – and, and I'll say this. So they did take pictures of it while it was uh, on the ground before they touched it. Um, um, they picked it up. I think they had gloves on. They picked it up, brought it back to the, um, to the trunk of the car, and opened it up in power zone. And they then asked, you know, what's the password? And of course, I didn't know it. Um, did you find out the password? I did. I called Alec, and he gave me the password. I repeated it to, to the agent. They put the password in and said, it's open. So Alec provided you the password that you passed to the agents, and it opened the phone? Is that yes, correct? sir. Okay. That's correct. John Marvin, were, were you aware of a <clears throat> news release that was issued that morning, Tuesday, June 8, that the public had no need to be alarmed or concerned for their safety? Yes, sir. Well, what was your reaction to that? I mean, it's, it's, it's quite baffling. It still is. Um, 
two people have been killed, and they're telling me that everybody's safe. I, that, that tells me that whoever's done this is in jail, and they, they are 100% positive. Because if they're not in jail, nobody's safe. Right. Um, it, Did you did you go back to to the residence at, at Moselle um, after finding the phone? Did you go back up to the house? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And and did sled agents come through and search it while you were present? Um, they did. Um, I don't know how long I'd been back up there, but um, uh, they came and and we kind of talked in the uh, playroom, or I think some have described it as the gun room. Um, yeah, they talked about that they needed to come in the house and and search for things. And, and did you um, escort, I think it was Agent McAllister, throughout the house? Yes, it was um, uh, Katie McAllister. And, and did she tell you what she was looking for? Well, initially, she says, uh, well, the way she presented it was, you know, there were so many people in the house. She said, listen, I, I don't want to just go barging in and make everybody run out of the house, but but I'm going to take my badge off, my gun off, and if you would, just walk me through each room. And, you know, particularly I'm looking for 12-gauge shotgun, guns, um, and 300 blackout, and the ammunition for those calibers. And, and as you're walking through the house with her, it, it appeared she was looking for other things besides just guns. Well, yeah, I mean, I, she, I mean, you could tell she's looking because she looked in spaces that guns wouldn't fit, so it makes sense that she could be looking for something else. Such as what? Well, I don't know. I mean, well, I, I understand, but you said spaces. Did she look in the well, I mean, bathrooms like, like I, and Well, like I opened up a, a, a up in the upstairs area. There's some, there's some cabinets that, you know, a couple of them are pretty small that, you know, she could find ammunition in there, but I don't know how you would get a gun in there. <clears throat> Did she search bathrooms? Uh, she did. Well, we, I, I took her through every room in the house. Right. I mean, every single room. Did you observe her looking in sinks and toilets? And you know, so yes, sir. It, it, what I observed is like the shower, for example. It's, you know, it's a, it's a door. It's not an open shower. She opened the door and she looked around, and you know, she was looking. At, she easily would have known there was no gun in it when she opened it, but she, it was obvious that she was looking a, a little deeper. Right. What kind of guns were there at Moselle? Well, it sounds like the guns of all kinds, uh, you know, rifles, shotguns. I, I've seen bow and arrows. I've seen crossbows. Most anything that you would hunt with. Right. And, the, um, and were guns mostly in the gun room, when, to your knowledge, when you were over there? Well, when I went through the house, we, uh, we identified, I, I remember one gun in particular that was in the bedroom, a shotgun. Um, I picked it up and said, you need to take this one. And we looked at it, and it was a 20-gauge. And she said, no, put that one back. So I put it back. So predominantly all the guns were in the, the gun room or, or playroom. Right. I, I, sort of an aside, briefly, <clears throat> do, you, do you hunt with Alec over the years? Uh, I have. And uh, d did he have a go-to gun, to your knowledge, that he would use? Not to my knowledge, I. Okay. When's the last time you ever seen him hunt with a 12-gauge? You know, I, I'd say that when he bird hunt, he's either shooting a 20-gauge or a 28. Um, you know, there was a there was a time in it, and. and Please don't ask me when, but I would say it was a, a few years prior to this that we were turkey hunting on a, another piece of property down on Savannah River. And I know he was hunting with a 12-gauge then, but I, I don't know whether it was his gun or somebody else's. Did that gun have a sticker on it, do you remember? <laughs> it did. And do you remember what the sticker said? No, I don't remember what the sticker said, but I do remember T's and Alec that when you're turkey hunting, you don't want to be seen and, you know, big sticker on the side of your barrel is, is kind of like waving a, a white flag to a turkey. Did, um, <clears throat> did you serve as somewhat of a liaison or the point person with SLED and the family um, initially? 
Um, I don't know that I'd call it a liaison or a point person, but I absolutely uh, I had I had become to know Agent David Owens, and I absolutely told David, I said, listen, if you need anything from me or anybody and you can't get in touch with them, you reach out to me. I'll, I will either see to it that they call you back, I will see to it that you get the answers that you're looking for, or I will put you in touch with the person you're trying to reach. So I did make myself available. And and did Alec give, to your knowledge, carte blanche to law enforcement to search anywhere that they wished? Oh, he did. In fact, that before I was going to just do something, you know, I, I knew that to be the case, but yes, he, he confirmed it with me. Anything they needed, any time they needed it. And, and you provided consent to search the house the afternoon on the 8th on his behalf, did you not? I did. Okay. And I've consented every time they've ever asked. We'll get to that. Did, were you ever asked to um, provide consent or see if you could obtain consent for any law enforcement to search your mom's house where Alec had been the night before? Say that to me one more did, time. Did any law enforcement ask you to consent or obtain consent so that law enforcement could search Almeida, um, and I'm talking about on the 8th, uh, because Alec had just been there the night before. Did, right. did anybody ask you, hey, can we go search Almeida? No one asked anything. Okay. Would, if asked, would you have obtained consent for law enforcement? I would, have, uh, I would have given them consent, and I would have taken them over there just like I did at Alec's house, and I would have helped uh, facilitate the search to show them areas that they may not know about. Do you remember um, law enforcement sled agents coming to your Greenfield property on June the 10th? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And, and what was that about? Well, um, I, I assume they coordinated it with Alec or, or, or Randy. I, you know what, I, I, I'm not sure who they coordinated it with, but yes, my understanding is they were coming to interview me, Randy, Alec, Buster, uh, I think that's it. But they wanted to do interviews with all of us. Okay. <clears throat> and did everyone congregate there at, at Greenfield? Yes, sir. Uh, we, well, we were at Greenfield. Um, of course, you know, that's we're staying there because of all this, and so it, it keeps me close to Hampton. So, But, yes, we all congregated there. And when the um, agents arrived, did they come inside and sit down and talk talk with each other of you, or how did that work? No, sir. I offered them. I offered them to come inside. It was as you can imagine, it was hot. Um, I said, come in and, you know, offer them a drink of water or whatever, just being polite. And they said, no, you know, we, we would like to go ahead and start our, our interviews. And where, where did the interviews take place? In their cars. And were they all done it simultaneously? Yes, sir. And how many sled agent cars were out there? Do you remember? Well, there was one for each person they were interviewing, and, and I would go ahead and guess that there were probably two or three more. And um, I'm not sure that we need to actually play this, but have you been in the courtroom and you've heard this audio tape of Alec being interviewed on 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 that um, June the 10th, uh, where he is states something either I did him so bad or they did him so bad? Have you heard that? I have. Uh, and you know Alex's voice? I know his voice very well. And what is he saying on that tape? Crystal clear, they did him so bad. I mean, and have you heard him say that before uh, his interview that day? You know, uh, I think I heard him say it um, either the night of or the day after, but I've also heard him say it many times after. Well before this trial started or anything well before any of this that's right when he was when when he was staying and, and living with us or between my brother and and us after um after maggie and paul were murdered on that night of, of june 7th was were you or other family members with alec for the most part you know for the that week and the week after that? You're talking about the days following? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I was. I, I made a, a conscious effort to 
to be with him. I mean, I, as devastating as it was for me, it was a thousand times worse for him. So I, I knew as a brother I needed to be there for him. And I was, I, you know. Of course, I didn't sleep with him, but... Right. But when we were awake, we, you know, I, he was, you know, I may not be standing beside him, but I, we would be in the room together. Or if we needed to go to the gas station, if he wanted to dip, I, you know, I'd ride with him. It just, I just knew that's, I just thought that's what I needed to do. What was, what was his demeanor that was in the immediate aftermath of these murders? Oh, Jimmy, I, I, that night or days or that night the next day the day after like I just said he is when you can use words that he was destroyed I heard somebody say he was broken you can use any words you want to use to describe but I can promise you words don't do it justice I would have to create a new word to to describe how distraught he was I it, it, it's and, and terrible then, and then carry it forward all through the summer. Did did he? How was he coping afterwards? Say later June and July and going forward. You know, summer? it's hard to tell. Um, I I thought he at times I thought he was doing okay. Um, other times it, it would just be just sheer grief. I mean, just uncontrollably crying and just, you know, of course it makes me cry. As y'all can tell, I'm, I'm a pretty emotional guy, but we would just, we would, we would cry together. I'm just, and there's no answers. It's just, and there's nothing I could say to make it better other than just hugging. Did, um, did you start losing weight? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, absolutely. Um, was he eating? Well, sleeping? He was he was pretty heavy going into this. Right. And he you know, he lost a, a good bit of weight. I don't know how many pounds, but it became very obvious in a fairly short period of time he lost weight. Right. Um it's a, I skipped over something in my outline, and I apologize, but, but going back on the evening of June seventh, early morning hours did um did, did folks who were there at Almeida uh, raise questions about perhaps the murder? Maggie and Paul were somehow associated with the You mean the Moselle? Yeah, the Moselle. Um, going back to on the evening of June 7th and June 8th, did folks at Moselle um, raise issues or associate the potential motive for the murder to be related to the boating acts in some form? Well, I heard it. I heard it numerous times that, that night. I heard it at Moselle, and I actually heard it by, well, Greg, Chief Alexander um, uh, mentioned it. You know, once, once I got over the, the chaotic part of describing what we were doing, why I needed to get to Moselle, he asked me on, you know, he's driving in front of me, and uh, he asked me, do you think it's related to the boat accident? And of course, I, Greg, I don't know. I don't know anything about what's happened. Well, you, you were aware of the boating accident and Paul's charges? Yes, sir. W weren't you aware? And, and was there a backlash in the community over that? What well, it was. It was. It was a lot of backlash. Um, I, I would not say quite as much in the community, but as on social media and and media inflamed rumors is what the way I would describe it. Right. That it just it, it, it was just totally blown blown out of proportion and, and and I don't want to downplay the accident but what they were saying about the the stuff about Paul and and yeah, like it, it, it's just it was just totally inflamed okay. and, and I'll, you asked about the the boating accident so I told y'all that I called um, uh, Michael Paul, my friend, to, to make sure I could go to the crime scene the next morning. Well, Michael Paul is one of my best friends, if not my best friend. Um, I called him that night while we were still down at the crime scene, not because he's in law enforcement, not because of anything, because he's my friend. And I, I actually told him on the phone, I said, uh, uh, MP is what I, I said, MP, I don't even know why I called you. I just needed to talk to somebody. And, um, and we talked and, you know, cried a little bit after I described He didn't know what had happened, so I told him, and 
you know, I cried, and, and he, you could tell he was upset. But in that conversation, he asked me also, do you think it, it, it could be related to the boating accident? Um, switching gears a little bit, John Marvin, when um, talking about visiting at your mom's house, mom and dad's house, um, there's um, let's talk. Where where do you routinely park, or where do you park sometimes um, when going over to your, to your mom and dad's house? Me, you asking where I park? You and and, and others, you know, in the family. Well, it, there's it's a couple of places you can park, depending on who's there, um, whether there's other cars there. You know, you can either park at, at the what you call a carport, and there's a big dirt area beside it. Um, you can park there, walk up to the side door, or you can pull around to the to the back corner, park there. Um, okay. You know, it's, it, I, I, it, we we all use both spots. I'm going to pull up and and look at it on your screen. As a matter of fact, I told you it's my mom's birthday. I went there yesterday. I pulled right into the back of the house, but I didn't turn around. I circled the house. Okay. So there's there's. So I'm going to pull up State's Exhibit 524. It's in evidence, Doug, and, and go to slide 38. And this is um, the, the uh, GPS OnStar data. And, if, and, Doug, if you'll blow up around the house, please, sir. Thank you. Um, Mr. Murdoch, this is your mom's house, and this is GPS data uh, from... Um, the night of June the seventh. Do you see that the the red line there? Yeah, it's pretty blurry on my screen. I don't know about y'all's. Well, you want, you want back it out a little bit, Doug? All right. Just... Is that better? Well, yes, it's still blurry, but I can see. It... Where is that in relation to your mom's house? You are talking about the um, right there where the arrow is pointing? Yes, sir. That is uh, at the back corner of the house. Okay. That, that would be exactly where I parked yesterday. All right. And if, and if you'll pull up, Doug, <coughs> Exhibit 136. And this would be Defendant's Exhibit 136 in evidence. And tell me where that is. That's the same area. That's what I'm talking about. Is that the same area that we just saw on the on the uh, last exhibit with the red dots? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Generally speaking, I mean, there's no it's, – it's such a wide open area, so when you pull up, you're not, like, pulling into the exact same spot each time to where you're, you're creating a road or whatnot. It's just, it's just a nice grassy area. You pull up, go up to the back door, and you're right there at the back of the house. And, and why do you go to the back of the house? That's – when my mom, when my dad was alive, um, there's a little breakfast room there with a recliner in it. He was either in that recliner, at the table eating, in the bed, or not at home. I mean, that literally was his. Right. So, so Doug, if you pull up Defendant's 135. So everything's at the back of the house. Right. I mean, it's just they don't use this. It's a large home, and they just don't. You know, as old as they are, well, my mom can't get out of bed, but as old as they are, they don't go to the front. I, I, I'm sorry, and just skip that. 131, defendants 131 in evidence, please. Again, is this a, sort of the same area of photograph from a different direction? Yes, sir. Now, what's that structure that we see in the background past that big oak tree? Uh, that was my dad's cookhouse or Man cave, as some people would call it. That's okay. Yeah, and 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 how far is that from from the um, house, roughly? You know, um, I would guess sixty to eighty yards. Okay. And that's uh, and is it open around there? I mean, from the photo, is that accurate? Depiction? Oh, it's a, absolutely. Um, All right. That whole area is a grassy area with, with oak trees and pecan trees.
John Marvin, I want to go to Labor Day weekend of 2021. Um, where, where were you that weekend? Do you remember? Labor Day weekend 21. Um, when Alec went to the hospital? Okay, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. So, um, so I had been out west um, fishing, and I came in on Saturday night. Okay. And did, um, did you, prior to Labor Day weekend 2021, were, were you aware as to whether or not Alec had an opioid addiction? No, sir. Did uh, you transport Alec, drive in Alec, from the hospital in Savannah to a detox facility in Atlanta on that, that weekend? or? Well, I believe it would have been on that Monday. Um, I was not driving. Uh, Randy and I took him. Randy was driving, and I was in the back. But, yes, sir, we did take him to a detox facility. And. And where was the facility located? Uh, it, just outside of Atlanta. Okay. And what was, can you describe for the jury Alex's Alex condition, like physical condition in the car? Yes, sir. So when I met Randy over in Savannah, he had Alec and, and I got in the car or, or Randy's truck with him. Um, it, I'd never seen anything like it. I've, I've seen television shows of, of talking about the leg twitching and, and the squirminess, if you will, and, and that's the first thing. I, I mean, you could just tell he was sweating. He was, he was thrashing about, um, you know, Jim. It, did he turn I don't around? know how much detail you want me to go into. What, did he turn around in the seat of the car? And what was he doing? Yeah, so, so maybe halfway there, um, at one point, he had taken his seat belt off and he had his head down where your fanny would be in the seat and is trying to stretch his legs and just kind of steady, just like thrashing them and kicking them. Um, it's just, again, I, I've seen TV, but I've never seen something like this in real life. And was he able to control himself? Uh, no, sir. Um, I said about detail. So he, he messed himself. He, he had diarrhea. Just couldn't control it. And then, um, and, and I say diarrhea. I'm not talking about at a restroom. I'm talking about in the car in his pants. Okay. And um, after um, <coughs> he spent some time in the facility in Atlanta, did, did you and your brother go pick him up and take him to another facility in Orlando, Florida? Yes, sir, we did. Do you, do you remember that? Um, yes, sir, I did. On the, on the drive to Orlando, do you remember anything happened that stands out to you? You know, so that drive, um, he, was, he was much different. He was, he was more subdued. He was not, it was not the thrashiness, not the twitching, not the, the jerkiness, if you will. I, I don't know the, the words that, that you would use for that, but that's what I'm saying. The, the only thing that really stood out for me is he was, and he slept a lot of the time, but, but he woke up from, from sleeping. And when he woke up, I mean, he jerked forward and you could just tell that, I mean, it was, it was sheer terror. It, it just, he just woke up out of a, out of a horrible, horrible dream. And I believe it was him dreaming about what, what he found with Paul and Maggie. Keep going a little further, uh, Mr. Murdoch. And sometime in September, did Sled actually come and search the house at Almeda? Yes, sir. And were you present? I was. Okay, and um, and you and did were you informed as to what items were seized during that search? I was informed of. One item that was received, uh, seized. And what item was that? Um, it was described as a, a coat. What kind of coat? Well, they didn't tell me what kind of coat. Okay. And um, and did they tell you where the coat was found? Yes, sir. So, um, so I, I would assume that the the searching of the house, all that was winding down. Um, so, Agent David Owens and I 
I believe Randy was outside near us, but he may have been talking to somebody else. I'm not sure. May have been talking to another agent. I, I'm not sure. But, but David Owens, um, or Agent Owens, came up to me and said, um, we found a coat back on the property. Do you know anything about it? And I said, well, David, I said, if you found it back on the property, I said, my, you know, it's a large piece of property, you know, some 400-something acres. I said, my dad rides this Kubota side by side. It's, it's probably his. And um, I said, and if you show it to me, I, I, mean, I, I can try to identify it. And, of course, he, he said he couldn't show it to him or wouldn't show it to me. I'm not sure what, what it was. Were you sometime later asked to view a photo of a blue raincoat? I was. Well, I was asked to view um, a raincoat and listen to an audio tape. Of the kennel? Yes, sir. Okay. On the, the blue raincoat, um, were you informed where it was seized from? Well, I knew where it was seized from because he had already told me. But, uh, but I was, in this instance, I was told that they wanted us to, or when I say us, they asked Randy, Lynn, and I to go view the coat and the tape. It, at this point, I knew where it had been, been recovered, but, but they said, we want you to view a coat that had come been recovered out of a closet. And, and was that different from what you were led to believe when you... Oh, well, absolutely. Okay. Had, um, had you ever... Did they ever provide any, anybody provide an explanation about why you were giving two different locations where a coat was found? To this day, no one's told me that. The photo of the coat that they showed you, had you ever seen that raincoat before? No, sir. And was it the blue raincoat? That well, it certainly looked similar to the one. I saw a picture. I didn't see the coat itself. Um, but it certainly looked, looked to be similar or the same. Had you ever seen it before? No, sir. Did you... Um, Recognize what closet it came out of um, when from photos during this trial. Well, I saw saw that. And I think I know what closet they're referring to. Well, they, there's let, only let me, two. Let me ask you, I'm the, sorry. The closet as you go up on the the first flight of stairs before you go at the landing, right there. It's what what's kept there. Clothing, not everyday clothing. Clothing that's more or less in storage. Um, I, junk, um, I, right. you know. It's it's not a club. It's not a club. First of all, my dad wouldn't climb stairs even if he could, but he couldn't. Right. The um, there's, there's some testimony that there's GSR on that rain coat. Um, got any idea how there could be GSR on clothing in your dad's closet at Almeda? Objection. No way. Stained. Did um, your dad carry guns around with him? Uh, no, not like not in the sense that you're saying. He, so he was not like Paul that always had guns with him. Um, you know, he would he would keep a gun if he went dove hunting, for example, and he went on one dove hunt. That gun may ride with him for two months. He it just would stay. He just would. Same with golf clubs. If he went back when he would play golf, it, he just. During a bunch of junk in his truck. During hunting season, was there normally a gun in the back seat? During hunting season, I, I would say that there usually would be. And, and did he if have? I did, it, it, during hunting season, because he always hunt, he always loved to go on a bird hunt. And did did he have a uh, a specific gun that he used frequently? Oh, he had one gun. And was did that gun have a name? <laughs> it did. It was called Bo Whoop. And uh, and did he clean it often? I, I've never seen him clean it. He he got that gun in nineteen, I believe, in nineteen fifty-seven for his high school graduation, and he used it for every game that he chased. But I'm sure it got cleaned somewhere along the way. But I'd never seen him clean it, and I still haven't seen him clean it. Got it. Um, I don't know how the thing still worked. Along the way, have, have you been receiving updates from SLED on their investigation in the Maggie and Paul's murder? 
Um, usually when I call, um, I would call Agent Owens and, and ask for updates, and, and he would try to provide some updates. It, 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 it almost always seemed like there was stuff that he really, I don't know, I don't know whether he didn't know or just it wasn't at liberty to say at the time, I'm not sure. But yeah, he would, I think he would try to, he would try to give updates as best as possible. And, and were you providing information on, on evidence that they had against your brother? I have been, yes, sir. Um, has some of it. And, and the information, some of the information that you've been provided turned out not to be accurate information. Yes, sir. What type of information? Well, I was told that at one point that there was a, a T-shirt that he was wearing. And can I back up and tell you how I got, how we got into this conversation? Sure. So I'm having a meeting with SLED. Yes, sir. Nature of the job. Call for your sir. Statement of an opponent, Your Honor, agent of it's a statement of a party opponent. Agent. Party opponent. Agent of the party opponent. Agent, agent. of yes, the sir. party opponent. Yes, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have you take a, a break now. Please do not discuss the case. All right, everybody be seated. Hear this, uh, this, hear this objection again. Stays objecting, calls for hearsay. All right, and your response to the, um, Mr. Yeah. Um, yes, Your Honor. Well, I'm, I'm your, here. Just a moment, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Conrad's response to Mr. Griffin. Your Honor, I think his uh, argument was it's an it's a admission by a party opponent. Um, and I don't think we're talking it's about... Party opponent. Party opponent. Right. And the subsection 801D2, 80, I think, is what we're referencing. Uh, and it talks about admission by a party opponent. Uh, it doesn't necessarily talk about the statement, um, and I think uh, what we're getting into are some statements by uh, particular law enforcement officers who've already been on the stand, uh, and uh, I don't think those are admissions to any issue that's of relevance in this case. Mr. Griffin? Your Honor, they're directly relevant. The statements relate to evidence that they've told the family they have against Mr. So Murdoch. Directly relevant? Yes, sir. Right, so the objection not based on relevance. Oh, I, th I thought that's what. So a statement of a party opponent is non hearsay under the definition of hearsay. Um, Your Honor, it's. I don't the, have the, the rule in front of me, but under. State, the, the state of South Carolina is a party opponent in yes, this case? And. and SLED is the investigative agency? Yes, sir. It, it, if otherwise, the rule would not apply in a criminal case. I mean, that's, I mean, it has to be the investigative agency. I'm not asking for Collin County statements or it's, it's the. No, you've gotten those in already. The newspaper statements, uh, Collin County's call to the newspaper or whatever. Yes, sir. What else, Mr. Um, Conrad. I'd also object for the relevance as well, Your Honor, uh, because uh, the state has not offered the shirt and the evidence, uh, and um, the, the defense is attempting to kind of backdoor here, and it simply doesn't go to any issue, anything that's issued in this He's trial. already testified to the shirt. 
Well, to the sure, but yeah. he's we're, he's trying to get evidence, uh, and maybe we need to profit it to see exactly what he would say. But my uh, assumption was that he was going to start talking about a report by Mr. Bevel, uh, which we've talked about several times in this case, uh, and I'd object to the relevance uh, and uh, to particularly with Mr. Murdoch bringing it up. All right. Well, uh, tell me again what you're asking the witness. Yeah, or yes, proffer it to the witness. Yes. Y yes. Um, yes. So, Mr. Murdoch, what what information <clears throat> were you provided by by was it a sled agent that provided you the information? Yes. You were asking him about Agent Owens. Still, he's a sled agent. Yes. And and what what information were you provided that that leading up to this that that turns out to be inaccurate? Right. And, and it was okay for me to speak to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so what I was asking, I, I was saying, I wanted to back up to get to where I was where I was getting this information. So, I'd been called to Sled, um, not headquarters, but their office in Walterboro to view the the blue coat and to listen to an audio. After my interview with them, um, Captain Ryan Neal, I, I believe we were in his office, is the one that. And I'm going to use my terminology here, but but describe the white T-shirt covered in blood. Even went so far as to describe that that Alec took the bottom of it and wiped his face with it, and that that's how they knew he he was involved. That's how they knew he was there. And and I don't know I don't know where the question goes Can after I ask that. Your question? Or are you trying to dig more out of him? That's it. All right, and what's your objection? I renew my objection to the relevance. Uh, nothing has been put. This uh, this jury hasn't heard any evidence about any blood being on this T-shirt, um, and the state has not offered any reports to suggest as such. The objection is It's going to take ten minutes. Thank you. Here we step down. Jury present. All right. Thank you. The objection is overruled. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, when we broke, the question on the table was about a conversation that, that you had with a sled agent um, re regarding some matter of evidence. Can you provide your answer, please, sir? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, as I was about to say, what what led me to this conversation was a sled um, asked uh, my brother, my sister, and I to come over to uh, identify or attempt to identify a coat and a, a recording um, and we did that and so I, I did my interview with them and then after the interview we went into um, Captain Ryan Neal's I think he's captain but, but, but Agent Ryan Neal's office at, this, at the same sled office and in that office or in that uh, in his office uh, we were all in there um, they made reference to a, a the shirt that they said Ellick was wearing. They told us that it was covered in blood. They went so far as to, to tell me on the on the police body cam that he takes his shirt and wipes his face, and that's how they knew that Ellick was at the scene, that that he was the one. John okay. so Marvin, um, just. Finishing up, what was Alex's relationship with Maggie and Paul's parents, um, Grandma and Papa T, as we've heard? Grandma and Papa T, that's great. They had a great relationship. Um, Alex and Papa T played golf together regularly. I mean, it's just a, a it's just a really good uh, father-in-law, son-in-law relationship, and and mother-in-law. And um, have you? Um, <coughs> they would you, travel together, you know, vacation together with. Different places. And, and have you stayed in contact with them as best you could? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, we communicate. And, and just briefly. Now, Papa T uh, has, that, has, taken, has taken ill um, and, and is homebound now. I was, I was going to ask you. He's, yeah, he's, 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 he's had a stroke and, um, and, and is, is basically homebound. Okay. And Miss, Miss Kennedy stays at home and takes care of him. 
But, but they are wonderful people. Let me just go a little bit further. At wonderful people um, in and of themselves, but their relationship was, was absolutely great. So, Mark, I, I want to go back to that morning of June the 8th when you were um, down at the kennel cleaning up. Do you remember... Um, making a promise that morning? Well, Jim, as, as I've, I've told you all that, y'all know what I saw. Y'all know what I was doing. It was, it was, it was difficult. It, 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 was, it was nearly impossible. Um, I, you know, in my mind and out loud, I told Paul I loved him. I told him, I don't know, I just, I, I loved him, and, and I promised him that I'd find out who did this to him. It's just, it's, it, you just don't know what to do, but it was just, it was tough. And you promised him you would find out who did this to him? Yes, sir, I did. Have you found out? I have not. All right. Thank you, Ron. That's all the questions I have. Good afternoon, Mr. Mur Murdoch. Good afternoon. Uh, I think you'd agree with me that no matter which way you cut it, your family suffered a great tragedy, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, Including the death of my dad and the, the sickness of my mom. I mean, it's just, it's tough. And I'm, I'm sorry you've been, you and your family's been through this. Well, thank you. All right. And I think you testified a little while ago about the cooperation you and particularly your brother provided SLED. Is that correct? Did I, did I provide cooperation with SLED? Yes. Absolutely. And you, to your knowledge. I have and, and, and will continue to. And to your knowledge, uh, your brother was providing cooperation to SLED as well, correct? I believe every, everyone in my family was, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, and would you consider that cooperation full cooperation? Not only for yourself, but your brother as well, from what you have observed? Uh, I mean, to me, full cooperation, yeah. I mean, it's, it's wide open. You, you tell us what you need from me, and, and I'll, I'll provide okay. it. And I told him I would provide it. And from what you've observed, your brother was was providing the same full cooperation as well, correct? Yeah, so I believe um, I believe any time that they ask to, to search something, any time they ask to to do something, they ask for information, um, it typically came to me and yes, I would I would provide it. Okay. Well, I'm asking about your brother right now. I understand you have. But to your knowledge, did your brother provide full cooperation? Or did he tell you he was providing full cooperation? Well he didn't tell me, but okay. But it, it appeared to be obvious that by him giving them access to anything okay. they asked for, that, that he was. Okay. So when did you first learn that your brother was down at the kennels just before the murders? Two days ago with the rest of us? No, no. Um, you know, I, so obviously I went into for an interview with SLED, the one I told you about where we, we talked about the shirt, talked about the blood, all that. That was, that was the reason for me being there was to hear that audio. And I saw the kennel, and, of course, at that point, I heard his voice, and I knew, I knew that was him. Okay. Uh, you knew that was him when you saw that video, correct? That's correct. When I listened to the video. When, when I listened to it. Right. And do you recall the date of that uh, interview when you first listened to that video? I do not. All right. would, would you disagree with me if I said it was August 12th of 2022? I, I have no way to agree or disagree. Or at I, least during the month of August of 2022? Uh, again, I, it, I'm sure they have my interview recorded for that okay. date. But uh, yeah. all right. Um, before August of 2022, at that interview, when you heard your brother's voice at the kennels, uh, had he ever told you that he was down there just prior to the murders? No, sir. Right. Did he ever tell you that afterwards, after you listened to that video? Uh, no, sir. And I, I'm trying to think if we've if we've been able to have an opportunity to even speak. Okay. Okay. All right. So you would agree that if he had not told Sled that, that was not full cooperation, correct? If he had not told Sled that he was at the kennels just before the murders, he had not actually been fully cooperative. What, what's your question? Would you agree that that is not full cooperation? By him not telling Sled that he was at the kennel? Correct. I would say that... Yes, he lied. Okay. 
All right, so I don't want to go through the whole kind of vehicle shell game that we talked about earlier. It's confusing probably to me most of all, but let's, let's just focus on, uh, so Paul's, what was Paul's normal daily driver? What vehicle did he dro- nor- drive on a daily basis? On a normal basis, he drove a white F-150 um, Platinum. Okay. And let me confuse you a little bit more okay. as I drive the identical truck. Okay. All right. Uh, so you testified that that Paul's F-150 Platinum, was at Jimmy Butler's over the weekend, correct? It was being worked on at Jimmy Butler's. That's correct. And then Monday, there's a series of car swaps. I don't want to go through them, but at the end of the day, uh, you end up in the F-250 farm truck, correct? That's correct. And Paul ends up in your F-150 Platinum. Ultimately, he does. He drives a mom's car okay, back cool. to Alameda. Gets right, I know there's several swaps. Yes, sir. That's, that's correct. I'm just kind of talking at the end of the day. Um, and he drove your F-150 back to uh, Al- Moselle, excuse me, that night, correct? To Moselle, yes, sir. Right. Uh, and uh, you testified that you came over uh, later that night after Alex had called you about the murders, correct? That's correct. Where was your truck parked when you first got there and we'll talk about how you got there in a minute but where was paul's truck well so first of all that night your truck, I'm sorry. that's right I, I know what you did so so when i got there mm-hmm. we didn't go anywhere near the house i went straight to okay. where everything was happening okay. um as we went to the house later that night i saw my truck so it's probably four in the morning whatever time we were three or four in the morning mm-hmm. it was parked in front of the house normally where you would park cars okay. So just kind of out straight out the front door? That's correct. And uh, the keys that Paul had been using, do you recall were they left in the truck or or have any recollection of where those keys might have ended up? Well, they were sitting in the ignition. I mean, same place I always leave them. Okay. Because I drove it to Alameda that night. All right. Um, And meanwhile, you're in that F-250 farm truck, right? For a short period of time. Uh, and that, r- refresh my memory, was that, a, is that white as well? or is it's, that a different It's white one? as okay. well, yes, sir. Uh, and it it's broke down on you on the way to Moselle, that, and, correct? That is correct, on Highway left, 63. All right. And you left it on the side of the road, correct? I did. Okay. And I think, did you call uh, Chief Alexander at that point? or? Well, we, we were riding, you know, we were driving separate cars, but together. Okay. And so at that point, he had gotten in front of me, and I had to call him to tell him to turn around. Okay. And he came back and picked you up. Came back and I jumped in his and car. You left the truck, truck or whatever. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm trying to talk over you. My apologies. Uh, and you left the F-250 there on the side of the road. I right? did. Okay. All right. And rode with Chief Alexander to the property? That's correct. All right. Um, were you aware that uh, uh, your brother Alex had loaned Chief Alexander money at several points over the past couple of years? I was not. And you testified that uh, you learned of your brother's opioid addiction uh, the weekend of uh, Labor Day of 2021. Is that correct? Well, that's when it started coming out, yes, sir. Okay. So did you have any idea that he had a, a, a opioid or drug problem prior to that? Prior to that, I did not. Okay. So from your uh, observations of him on a daily basis, he seemed to be sober uh, at, at most times or, or not under the influence of any... Did you ever observe right. him or well, well, keep in mind now, so, again, I'm not a lawyer in the firm. I live in Beaufort, so I, you know, I don't see him daily. Okay. But, but our encounters usually would be during uh, non-working hours. Mm-hmm. But even then, yes, um, it, I, I, had, he had no, I had no reason to think he was on, on pills. Okay. All right. Um, he's able to function pretty normally on a daily basis to your observations? Yes, sir. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about the morning of June 8th. You said that you were the first person over to the house at Moselle that morning. Is that, did I understand that? That's correctly? correct. Uh, and you're the first person inside the house at that point? That's okay. correct. Okay. Um, and so do you recall when Blanca Simpson got there? I, I don't. Okay. Um, uh, what I can tell you is I was the last to leave the house and the first to come back in. So she would have gotten there some point after you? Yes, sir. That and and I've heard in testimony that instead of going to Moselle, she went to Almeida. Mm-hmm. Um, but when she came to Moselle, it would have been after you, correct? I think the other folks were there as well. Yep, yeah, but well after me. Well, okay. 
And he testified about being in that, I guess some folks call it the gun room, uh, when Sled came in and started looking at some of those guns in the gun room, correct? That's correct. Well, well I wasn't in the gun room. I was in the main part of the house. Okay. Did you ever go into the gun room while I, Sled was in I there? did. Okay. Um, because I think there's a video and evidence, and we're not going to go dig it up, but uh, of uh, Sled with camera, body camera footage, and I think you do appear a bit. I think so. I think probably what uh, best recollection I have is I was in the main part of the house with Alec and, and family, and someone came and told me they were there and that they wanted to look around. Okay. And, of course, I went to make sure that they had full access. When you were in there, do you recall who was in there with you other than the sled agents? Because um, there were several other people, correct? Well, I don't recall. if you Without seeing the video, I saw the video. I saw Mark Ball. I saw Lee Cope. Um, I saw the, the agent McAllister, but but I, I don't think I would have remembered that. Okay, but there are several attorneys in there, though at a minimum. Correct? Friends and attorneys, friends. Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, was Chris Wilson in there at that time? You, you know, I don't I, I don't remember. Okay. I, I, I don't have any recollection of him being there. Okay. Um. All right, and then you, let's go to June tenth when Slick came over to I believe it was Greenfield where they came. That's correct. An interview. It was, it was you, Buster, uh, Randy, Alex. Uh, I guess that's four, right? Is that all who were interviewed that day, to your recollection? Um, Randy, me, Alec, and Buster. That's correct. Okay. Uh, I think you testified that they didn't want to come inside. Is that what you testified to? Well, I. I I don't think they didn't not want to come inside because of any particular reason. I just think they wanted to get about their business. So you don't recall? Uh, I, I offered for them. I offered to come in, use the restroom, anything of that nature, drink water, anything like that. But they, okay. you don't they did not. You don't recall Lieutenant Gint coming in and introduce himself? Inside the lodge? Mm -hmm. I do not. Okay. All right. Um, and you've... you've either been interviewed or sat in several interviews by SLED over the last few years, have, correct? I've been in a, a few, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and I'm going to direct your attention to uh, October 12th of 2010. Let me make sure I have that date correct. Or excuse me, not 2010. That would have been 2021. Uh, and I believe SLED came to your house that day. Do you recall that? Day? I do recall SLED coming to my house. Okay. Now, um, I, I can't tell you that's the date, but they, they this, certainly came. This would have been the day that they interviewed both Buster and your wife uh, that day. You, you, does that help you out? It, it does. I, re I remember them coming. It okay. was um, uh, Jeff, Agent Croft, and, um, and I believe um, Agent Ryan Kelly. Okay. Um, and uh, you sat into both those interviews, correct, with both Buster and, and your wife? Well, I think the, the interview with with – one was an interview for Buster, okay. and one was an interview with with me and my wife. Okay, all right. So you you is the way I, that's the way I thought it was. Okay, I didn't think it was three interviews. All right, and you recall during that uh, October twelfth interview, the subject of this blue jacket coming up with, with Buster. Specifically, I'm talking about the one with Buster. The conversation at my house. Yes, I October do not 12th. recall it coming okay. up. You so you don't recall a sled bringing up uh, asking Buster about a blue jacket. On October 12th, I do not recall that. So you don't recall uh, his response? I, I don't recall him bringing up a jacket. Okay. Uh, do you recall Buster responding that he did not recognize the blue jacket that was presented to him? I don't recall a blue jacket being discussed. Okay. And I think you also looked at it, and you don't, you don't recall? They did not show me a blue jacket. There, there was no blue jacket discussion in that interview, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, Do you recall what the bus's response in that interview to being asked if that could be Randolph's jacket to him saying if it's over $15, no, it wasn't? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay what Buster said. He's asking to recall what Buster said. I sustain the objection. And then you agreed with what Buster said right afterwards. 
You don't recall that? No, Mr. Conroy. What I'm telling you is I don't recall any discussions of a blue jacket in, the, in that interview. I, I just don't recall that. I don't. That, so you asking okay. me that, I'm just telling you, I don't know of any discussions about a jacket in that interview. Okay. All right. Um, you testified about driving up to rehab, um, I think, that Monday after Labor Day. Or excuse me, uh, detox, correct? With it was brother. detox, okay. that's correct. Um, and you said your brother kind of woke up startling as if from a dream. Is that what you testified to? No, sir. Okay. I said that when I was driving, well, Randy and I were driving him from detox mm -hmm. to the rehab facility down, and that was down in Orlando, Florida, okay. is when that happened. All right. And you said, and, and again, I want to make, make this as clear as we can, you said you thought that he was waking up in response to a dream about the night of June 7th. Is that, do that, I understand that correctly? That is the way I, I, that's what it appeared to be to me. And that's, okay. of course, I can't tell you what he was dreaming, okay. but that's certainly what it appeared to me. So you're not saying that because he said that, right? No, he, that's right. Okay. He, he didn't wake up and say that. It's just, it was a, just such a startling, um, just the way he woke up out of his sleep. It was just so startling. It was fear. It just, and it, and it took him several seconds to, to realize that whatever he just, he, he just saw was not real or, or was not, he was not living it. Okay. Um, you testified about um, the day of June 7th and the, uh, taking your dad to the, to the hospital, him getting admitted, correct? I did. And that you were, you and your brother Andy were sending out multiple group texts about your dad's status. Is that correct? Well, I sent a text, sent and I believe Randy sent one as well. Okay. Uh, and Along with phone calls. Um, I know Randy and I discussed it on the phone as well. And if I understood your testimony correctly, and uh, you said that uh, June 7th is actually kind of a hopeful day. Is that uh, based off of what the doctors were saying. Well, yes, based on the all the bad news that he's been receiving, it it it, it was one little piece of of hope that, you know, certainly if the doctor would have said at that point, you know, you're going home on hospice tomorrow, it would have been that, that would be the worst case. But him saying that there was hope that it was pneumonia and not the cancer, that there was some breathing treatments that may help, it it gave us some hope. And you sent out at least one group text with this information, correct, to, to your family members, right? I know I sent one. I, I could have sent another, but I know there was one. Okay. Uh, and do you recall if your brother was included in that? Alex, uh, by specifically, was included? You know, I, I saw the, the, the record showing it, and so, yes, okay. um, I, I believe it was my family, and, and I think it was just our family, actually. And so... Uh, there was hope, at least on the afternoon, June 7th, that your dad who had pneumonia, which could potentially be treated, and uh, there was a little bit of hope about that, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so if your brother uh, had told Janine Seconder uh, during that day that your dad was taking a major turn of the worst, that would not be truthful, correct? That would be correct, and the testimony I heard is he didn't say that. He didn't say what? He didn't say it was terminal or dire or whatever, what, whatever you're saying. Are you based off of Alex's testimony? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So if Janine second. So, well, I can tell you this. If somebody said that day that it was terminal, one of two people was wrong or both. Okay. All right. So if Janine Seconder was told that. If Janine that Seconder just said that, she was wrong. Well, were you present for any conversations between your brother and Janine Seconder on June 7th? I wasn't. One last thing, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, would you say that the Murdoch name and legacy is something that's important to you and your brothers? Yes, I think any family's name and legacy is important to them. Uh -huh. Do I think my family's name is more important than 
yours or any of y'all's? No, I don't. Okay. But it's important to your brother as well, correct? I think he would feel the exact same way as what I just said, that, that all families are important. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Defense reps, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is the defense's case. And we will excuse you for this day and have you come back at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Have a good evening. Everyone will be seated. And defense has rested any matters of law at this time. Your Honor, we would, uh, defense would just renew our motion for directed verdict on the grounds previously argued at the close of the state's case. Uh, Mr. Waters. Uh, Your Honor, again, we would rely on our arguments previously made uh, that the motion should be denied. Be happy to answer any specific issues Your Honor may have, but I would rely on our previous arguments. All right. The motion is denied based on all the reasons stated at the close of the state's case. Now, with regard to reply, what, what do you have, Mr. Waters? Uh, yes, sir. We have. Uh, Maybe four witnesses, maybe five at this point in time. I'm uh, hopeful that we could accomplish that in a day. Uh, obviously, uh, as is the nature of reply, um, we will you know, assess that tonight. But uh, right now I have uh, four definite witnesses and perhaps a fifth that, as it stands right now, that we would have. I don't think many of them except for one would be very lengthy. And by lengthy, I don't mean exceptionally so. Any comment, Mr. Harputlian or Mr. Uh, uh, Your Honor, I no way critical of Mr. Waters, but his estimate of time has been a little Um, mushy, I think, is a good way to put it. I I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying his, this was going to be a three-week trial, and now it's a six-week trial. Um, I I'm just uh, a little skeptical that we'll get it all done tomorrow. I'm just saying I'll be happy. I'll be ecstatic if it happens. But for planning purposes, um, perhaps uh, maybe midday Wednesday would be a better a better. Uh, what jury does it do? Pardon me? Jury does it. Oh, and somewhere in this process, uh, Your Honor's indicated you'd allow the jury to visit the, uh, the site. At so. the close of the um, reply. Okay. So we're at, I guess, Mr. Uh, Waters' mercy, too. Mr. Waters, are these witnesses who uh, you anticipate will uh, contradict issues presented by the defense or address the credibility of matters raised by the defense? They will be focused on, on issues that were raised during the defense case, yes, sir. All right. Okay. Well, 9.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you, Your Honor. Have a good evening.